Hey, okay. Hi, here we are. Hi, Taylor. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you? I'm I'm really well. I love we kind of match. We kind of match, and then I'm wearing light, you're wearing dark, but we kind of we didn't plan that. We didn't plan that. <laughs> no, I was gonna just go with it. <laughs> but um we're doing Thrive with, on Thursdays with Taylor Riley and myself, Linda Downey. And Taylor and I both um, work extensively in the health space. And Taylor, specifically, you work with insulin resistance and people with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, right? Yes. And I um, work with people with chronic health conditions, autoimmunity, and I'm specifically working a lot right now with people who have um, stuck trauma, past, past trauma, stuck emotions, a lot of chronic stress because that greatly impacts their health. So we thought we would talk today about mood, blood sugar, stress, past trauma, how it affects all of that, right? Is that what we thought we would talk about? <laughs> like a continuation of what we started to talk about last week, yeah. um, where we were really talking about what causes insulin resistance? What is that? Those blood sugar spikes. And we were talking about how stress is a huge factor that contributes to that among many other um, health issues. Um, and also um, the role that diet plays in that too. So today we thought we would explore a little bit of exactly what happens when you have that insulin resistance and now you have those blood sugar fluctuations, how it affects your health and especially how it affects your mood. Because I don't know about you, Linda, but I suspect it's very similar um, as my clients have experiences that they, when they have these ups and downs with their blood sugar and their mood, um, it often becomes this horrible um, just cycle. You yeah. know, they're, they're feeling fatigued, so they're reaching for, you know, garbage kind of comfort foods that are not helping their cause, or they're really stressed and they get so overwhelmed with that anxiety, um, and it just kind of becomes this horrible closed circuit. So I'm really excited to talk about that again with you today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and um, and you, you work so much with the food, and I work with the, the stress and the, the, looping thoughts of stress and the past trauma and things like that but they both you know impact the whole system and the biochemistry of the system so it's it's just really interesting and and then people can sort of see hmm for me is it is it a food thing am i really not managing my diet well or am i managing my diet well but i have these these traumas and these emotions that are keeping me triggered or maybe i have both um, for me, it was both. For most people, I think when you have really significant health issues that are not going away, it's both. Mm. And, then, and then, you know, the relationship of the gut to all of that and how the gut is related to the nervous system. So, yeah. So that's our Thrive on Thursday conversation. So, um, you know, from my from my camp, I was I was thinking about how the limbic system, which is the part of the brain that is really responsible for memories and for like the emotional um, attachment that you put on a memory. So, you know, something happens in your life and you remember it either significantly or you're kind of like, gosh, I don't even remember that. Oh yeah, that did happen when somebody mentions it. And what makes one memory be significant and another one be so small is the emotion that's attached to the event. The bigger the emotion, the stronger that memory is. And so the limbic system is the part of the brain that is responsible for memories and things like that. And what's so interesting, I'm tying it into our conversation, but what's so interesting, I'm like, <laughs> okay. I love this. like, don't think I just went awry. I am going to tie it in. Um, the, that part of the brain, which is the amygdala and the hippocampus, have a lot of cortisol receptors on them more cortisol receptors than some other parts of the brain or other parts of the body. And cortisol is the stress hormone. So more receptors means more hormone is going to go in there. And that causes like an imprint on the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So it causes a nervous system to stay triggered on because of the memory component of that. And then those cortisol receptors 
um, so people feel chronically stressed from things that happened in childhood. Mm. So, and now if they're chronically stressed and they've used food to sometimes manage their stress, which is where you come in, right? Like just eating emotionally and then creating a bigger problem now because the diet is a problem. So, right? Does that, you see that happening? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we've all been there, right? Where you are just feeling really overwhelmed, really stressed, or you've had, you know, a tragedy happen or a trauma happen in your life. And you're just kind of emotionally stunted in that moment. And what do we do? You know, we have different ways that we self soothe, self soothe, right? And a big one that people um, turn to almost instinctually is food. And why is that? And that's because when we are in a place of anxiety, right? Like we're up here, the thoughts are everywhere, right? That monkey, that monkey mind, that chatter, it's all over the place, right? When we're in a chronic stress state, it's like you can't focus on one thing. It's just all of the things, right? And by eating, it's actually bringing us back into our physical body and grounding us um, in a way. So people reach for that food. Um, and then again, that becomes a physiological response as well, right? So you were talking about how the cortisol is triggered by chronic stress. When when you're eating foods that are, you know, high, high in fat, high in sugar, high in salt, you know, that magical combination that food scientists put together right, that makes your brain go ding, 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 and all that dopamine and all that serotonin get released. Think about, you know, um, a cookie, um, a slice of pizza, a big bowl of pasta, all the foods that we call comfort foods, right? Whatever that comfort food is to you, it's because when you're eating it, it's triggering a cascade of those feel good hormones to combat right? All of the stress hormones. And yeah. what's interesting is, Linda, when you were talking about the, the chronic stress and that cortisol release, right? We know that that is affecting our body's physiology and our ability to digest food and metabolize energy, right? Because that's part of big contributing factor to that insulin resistance we were talking about. So what happens then? You're, all this cortisol is being released. You have this insulin resistance. All the blood sugar is circulating in the body, right? So now your blood sugar goes through the roof because there's no place for it to go. You start feeling exhausted, mm. so fatigued, and you can't figure out why because you just woke up or you haven't really done anything, right? So you're just so tired, and that's what happens when your blood sugar is high. And what do people do when they're tired? They reach for food, right? Right. Because they're trying to get some energy, some calories, some something in there. And then the adverse happens too. When that blood sugar dips too low due to the reactions from chronic stress and poor dietary habits, right? When it dips too low, not only do you have that cortisol response, but you have a release of adrenaline as well. Because what your body is trying to do is stimulate more glucose. So it's going to your liver and trying to get all this glycogen and trying to get any kind of sugar, any kind of fuel it can. And then you start to feel irritable and angry and aggressive even. Um, and all of those things, I've had some of my diabetics um, say to me that when their blood sugar dips too low, they almost feel like they're in a drunk state. Like they almost feel like incoherent and mm -hmm. angry and argumentative and they can't quite piece it together. They have like this fog. So, you know, it's really... I think just fascinating how our bodies work, but I think when people understand, you know, what you're talking about, how, you know, your brain is a big factor, how you're thinking, how it's influencing your physiology, how it's making you reach for food and comfort, and again, triggering a similar response, there's like no way you could escape that cycle without being aware of it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's the awareness, I think, that is so key. That's a really good point. And um, 
And then another layer of that is if that didn't seem complex enough, because it did, but there is another layer to it, which is, you know, that chronic stress response, you've got the, um, that affects over time, the health of your gut. And anybody who's ever been nervous, like, oh, I'm about to do a Facebook Live, I'm nervous, you know, or uh, I'm over that now, I, but I used to have that. But, you know, public speaking or anything that would make you nervous, you get butterflies in your stomach, right? It goes, you, we, we even have a phrase for it because it's so common. And that's because there's um, a strong, the vagus nerve, which is the main nerve for the rest and digest, um, goes down from behind the ear down and and lands all the way in the gut. And so when the there's nervous system activation, it triggers things in the gut. And when that's happening regularly, so you're stuck in fight or flight, mm-hmm. now you're going to cause what we call dysbiosis in the gut, which is an out of balance ratio of good to bad bacteria. And what mm-hmm. does that do? That um, will affect your blood sugar can of worms isn't it (laughs) it's a whole yes it is a whole nother can of worms and it will um back to moods it will affect your neurotransmitters because the neurotransmitters so you were just talking about you know people wanting pasta and cookies because you get the the serotonin and those feel-good hormones um or neurotransmitters rather but also in your gut once you've done a spent a long enough time in this chronic stress now you're not making your neurotransmitters right so now you're most people have don't even realize how your gut plays such a vital role in regulating these hormones and and neurotransmitters right it's even referred to as the second brain that microbiome and some people have don't even realize this i think it's fascinating but um it's such a great point to bring up for for people to start to understand and be empowered with that knowledge yeah well i mean the people that i work with everybody has some form of gut issue you know they're they're constipated or the opposite or they're always bloated or they don't you know they just don't feel well sometimes um i'll talk with people and they'll start off with all these other symptoms and then i'll say and how about your gut and like oh yeah like it didn't they're so used to it it's been yeah it didn't even occur to them to bring it up because they're like always constipated or the or they didn't know same and they're for like a decade and then they didn't even know that it should be any other way or it could be any other way because that was their normal that's their norm so when i say you really should poop two to three times a day they're like two to three times a day i poop two to three times a week maybe is what they'll say some people yeah so so and that's like a layering on of of all of this process so um important so important and so that's what i really started to see i was i was working with people around their gut but this limbic system you know triggered on since they were a kid issue keeps us from getting their gut healed and that's it that's it you got to go to the root cause and if the root cause um is in this locked trauma in this chronic stress response um in this emotional state that is like a snapshot that their brain has stored um of how this of of how your brain is you know the operating system of how the operating system is supposed to function then try as you might there's nothing you're going to do to clear up that that gut until you resolve that. That's why the work you do is so tremendously important and and it's and it's so important that people understand getting to the root cause is is really what needs to be done otherwise you're just managing symptoms, you know? You might as well just take a take a pill for that, right? Right. And what you do on your end is also getting to the root cause because you're really helping them overcome that insulin resistance and reset all of that. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you do? Well, in in the same way that um, Linda's talking about getting to the root cause of why the body is in this chronic stress state, which is influencing this cascade of other health problems, right? 
when we spoke last week, we explained a little bit um, about how food affects the insulin resistance as well. In fact, most people when they're diagnosed, the people that I work with that are either pre-diabetic or type two diabetic already, when they're diagnosed, they're, you know, their doctors don't explain to them what the insulin resistance part is, what that piece is. They just try to help them manage the blood sugar, which fluctuates as a result of the insulin resistance. So again, you know, you have two choices here. You either manage the symptoms, right, by taking metformin or counting out 40 net carbs per meal or something, you know what I mean? Something yeah. that's going to alleviate the symptoms, but you're never getting to the root cause of what's causing those symptoms, what's what's influencing those symptoms, which is really the insulin resistance. So if we focused our efforts instead on healing our bodies from the insulin resistance, right? Healing our bodies from the trauma instead of medicating and managing symptoms, then that unlocks the key for lifelong health. And the big thing I think that is most important, Lindsay, and I'm sure you'll agree, is sustainable health, right? Because once you understand how to do this, yes, you'll 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 be able to create um, greater thriving health for yourself going forward. Yes. And I think that the people that we work with have similar concerns about taking it on. I'm guessing, I don't, I don't know if you've come across it, but I was thinking of this as you were talking. And that is people are really afraid to try to change their diet. I, I, I can't do that. It's too difficult. I can't eat that way. Or uh, it's never going to be good again. Let me just tell you people, because Taylor won't say it, but Taylor's an amazing chef who has been a chef on like major five-star yachts um, and in and top restaurants in New York City. So, um, so Taylor is a great chef, and so she actually helps people. <laughs> it was true. I knew you weren't going to say it, so I'm I'm going to say it for you. But. Um, so that people learn like, oh my goodness, I can actually do this and um, eat well and be happy, you know, with what I'm eating. I don't have to be restricted. And the people that I work with um, are afraid to go and deal with those emotions that they've shoved down. And it's hard to please. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the places where they feel really locked and locked. And so, having that partnership and figuring out how to eat well and how to release the emotions in a way that is going to feel safe and okay. That's really a big part. It's hard to do that on your own, but Jen, yeah. um, Jen Gray just uh, typed in. So working on trauma helps with insulin resistance. Yes. Yes, it does. Yes, absolutely. And it's a big and it's a big factor, Jen. And I know a lot of times in that conversation, the main focus is food, right? Because again, that's coming from that managing the symptoms approach. And if we manage how much sugar we eat and, and take in, then we're managing that blood sugar. But if we're talking about solving the insulin resistance, then we absolutely have to look at chronic stress as a big key factor here. So absolutely. And Linda, to what you're saying too, you know, it's been my experience working with people and I'm sure, um, Many of your clients have felt this way too. When people talk about chronic stress or trauma or releasing these trapped emotions or coming to term and facing things that maybe they've been avoiding looking at or dealing with for decades, right? We, we see things in social media that like you have to go and join an ashram, you have to go pray and meditate for hours a day in the Himalayas, you need to fast, right? So it's like, it seems like the solutions are these like really extreme methodologies um, when that's really not the case, right? Linda is able to guide her clients um, not only with empathy and support, but to show them, you know, things that you can do that in a, in a matter of moments, you can have these major breakthroughs um, in the same way that I try to help people make shifts with food. You don't have to just eat salads and steamed vegetables, people. There's an easier way. You know, it's just about, like you said, Linda, finding the support that you need that's going to be tailored to your life and your your circumstance that's going to be able to address your unique personal history. And I think that's, you know, a really important takeaway. 
Yeah, me too. I love that point. You're right. Cause I've never been to the Himalayas. <laughs> I haven't been to an ashram. You have been to an ashram, but I have not. And, um, and I have trauma, you know, so trauma can be uh, with a capital T, like really, you know, horrible things that happen to people and trauma can be everyday life. You know, you're, um, you don't, get to sit next to your friends in the lunchroom, you know, that's traumatic for a first grader or whatever. So, and, and anything in between. And I have had significant trauma in my life. My, my mom passed when I was four years old. Um, you know, I was, I grew up in an alcoholic household and each of those things gets layered on and we, and we cope and I remember in my 20s is when I really first started taking on my childhood trauma. But I'll tell you, started in middle school, a stomach ache in the afternoon before I had to go home because I didn't want to, right? So that those stomach issues, I remember at 2.30 yeah. in the afternoon having a stomach ache when I was still in elementary school because I was like, you know, and, and it, whatever you're going home to, you know, but... um and then the next thing you know, but at 21, I have ulcerative colitis because the years of those stomach aches build up, right? Mm. You don't have to go to the Himalayas to unravel it. There are beautiful, effective tools that um, that I use with my clients. And, and I try to use a lot of different ones because what works for me may be a little different than what works for you, right? So all of that, that was a really great point that you don't have to do it and it doesn't have to overcome your life, although you do need to pay attention to it and you do need to make a commitment to making the change. So um, I'm just going to read. Can you see comments? Um, I, I can't see them here. No. OK. So one says it's a vicious cycle. Scared and intimidated about working with trauma and diet is so overwhelming and becomes expensive. Every day for three years, I haven't had one good day with my health issues. I start somewhere and I feel worse. Very, very frustrating and disheartening. Yes, it is. It is. Um, and unfortunately, our culture doesn't support a healthy lifestyle in, exactly. in, in both of our areas. So the foods are, you know, not great. What you can get when you're out and about, what you what is easy to work with in a busy schedule. Our foods do not really support nutrient. You got to you, you have to learn what Taylor's teaching you. That's what you have to do. You have to learn what Taylor's teaching you because the way most people eat is not happening for you know yeah. it's not helping. And um, and the same thing with you know with what I do. You have to just make a commitment that you're going to get to the bottom of it. But it's it's definitely possible. It's hard. And Jen, to speak to you know that type of, of cycle, and I honor you for you know making such a nice comment and engaging here and and raising your hand. Um, you know what happens when we feel like we try things right and it doesn't work. So you know it affects our mindset and how we view ourselves and what we feel we are capable of. Um, and I'm not sure. And Jen, I certainly don't want to put words into your mouth, but I've worked with so many people, Linda. And I'm sure you have too, where they come to me and they're like, "I just feel like I'm broken. Like maybe this is just it for me. This is just what my body is, and I have to deal with it. Or I'm just getting old, and this is what happens, right?" Um, because what happens there is, right, we start with our mindset, right, what we believe we're capable of, what we believe about ourselves, right? I'm a winner. I always succeed. I always find a way to win, right? We find an action plan. We adhere to the action plan. We don't see results, right? So then it affects our mindset. I'm a failure. I didn't try hard enough. Why can't I stay motivated? When really, it might just be that you don't have a good action plan that's working for you, right? And now you get stuck, like you said, Jen, in that cycle where you're trying all these things. And the more you try and the more you fail, the more you're building up that stress level that, you know, and, and stress when Linda's talking about it, um, you know, it's not just the stress that you know about. It's not just the stress that you think about. We're also talking about the stress that your body is under, you know, physiologically, your body is under stress, whether or not you are cognizant of it or thinking about all of the, you know, the stress all day, um, your body is still in a stress state. Um, and that is a very vicious cycle to break um, without 
help. And it's not an issue. And I just want to remind everybody, and I know we talked about it last time, to have grace with yourselves because there, it's just everybody's learning as we grow. And the more you learn, you know, the better you can do. Um, but really, you know, it's, it's about, Linda, like you said, just being fiercely committed to breaking that cycle um, and just being willing to keep going out on a limb and finding something that will work for you because it's worth it and you're worth it. Right. And just because you haven't found it yet does not mean it's not out there. So Jen is saying this would be great for you, um, Taylor. Can you define insulin resist resistance? Sure. So insulin resistance is what happens when, okay, so when our bodies, when, when we eat, our bodies break foods down into glucose is the main fuel source that our muscles use, okay? So that glucose, right? So your blood glucose or your blood sugars, right? That glucose is circulating through your bloodstream and it's, you know, touching on all of the receptors on the muscle cells, right? So it's like at the door of the muscle cell and the muscle really wants that glucose. It really needs it for energy. And the insulin is the key that unlocks the muscle cell so the glucose can go in. Now, what happens when we have insulin resistance is when there's something that's gumming up that lock and the insulin can't do its job and allow the glucose to go into the muscle. Does that help, Jen? Yeah, we'll, we'll see I if this one. I, I also think of it, I think maybe we had this conversation a little bit last week, but I think of it as like, I think of insulin as like the hall monitor. So blood sugar is going falls, which are your, is your blood is your blood stream, and then each of the classrooms on the, in the hallway, right? The picturing like a big school classroom hallway. Those are the cells, and the sugars going down the hallway and needs to get into the classroom. And insulin is like the the hall monitor, standing at the doorway, pulling it in. Nope, you come in, but. Um, she says, yes, great example. So um, so I think of that that resistance as kind of like a kid when you're saying to your kid, clean up your room, clean up your room, clean up your room. After a while, they're just like, wah, 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 wah. Like they just don't listen, right? There's like a resistance. They don't even hear what you're saying. And that's kind of like the cells are like not even paying attention to what the insulin is trying to do. So Jen says, Exactly. Broken is right. Mm. Mentally burned out so much. Mold, limes. Yep. Um, I'm afraid to go to therapy. I feel to work on trauma. They'll think I'm crazy because I'll just break down. I have high fasting glucose as well. And I don't have a gallbladder either. So Jen, the reason why people get these multiple health conditions is because the body has been thrown off and can't do its job. It's not like each one of these is its own thing and you have like five things. They all have the same root cause. Yes. Right? An, an immune system that is balanced and working well can handle mold, can handle Lyme, right? Even that the um, the activation, the mast cell activation is all, all has... Um, you know, a correlation to the chronic stress. So yes, mold and Lyme are external things that got into your body, but your body's ability to handle them has been compromised because of these underlying factors. And the trauma is huge. Um, what I do is not therapy. I'm not a therapist, but we, we, we get into and we dismantle the trauma that's had you by the throat. Um, but the key thing, if I want to jump in and explain a little about what Linda does and why it's different, because in therapy, you're talking about something and you're processing something, but you're not taught the practical tools to release these things. Um, because there's always going to be, you know, um, the next emotional response that you're going to have. So until you're empowered with the tools, to manage this stress, manage this trauma, manage, you know, life, right, as it happens, um, going to a therapist, sure, it might help in the short term. And there's definitely a place for all different modalities. Don't get me wrong. Going to a therapist might help 
in the short term because you're able to energetically release some of it by talking about it. But if you're not getting the tools that you need to really address it and, and specifically get in there so you can release it and learn how to do that, then again, you're it's more of a Band-Aid solution than it is really empowering you to address it from the root and, and learn how to do that for yourself. Right. And I want to say, I'm waiting for my dogs to start barking because my son's getting home from work. Hush, hush. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but when I your dogs start barking, my dog starts barking over here too. Like, where's where's a buddy? <laughs> <laughs> um, and Jen, the other thing that I want to say is um, two things. When I what I was reading, what you have. Oh, you say you have high fasting glucose. Somebody who would have high fasting glucose, to me, that's even just one more indication of the chronic stress because you're pumping out the sugar because your cortisol is staying elevated because your nervous system is staying in fight or flight. That's why even though you're not eating, your glucose is staying up, right? Because the, our blood sugar goes up because of what we eat and because of stress, the, re the release of cortisol. So that's just one more like mm -hmm, your, your, your nervous system is triggered on. And then the second thing that I want to say, and I think it'll relate to anybody is um, we're all afraid to cry and cry and cry, right? Like to break down. But if you can frame it that emotions are just emotions, we think some emotions are good and some emotions are bad. Hush. And therefore, I don't want to feel the bad ones, right? I'm okay with feeling the good ones, but I don't want to feel the bad ones. But what if all human emotions are just that? They're just human emotions. And there's no good or bad about any of them. It's appropriate at times to cry. It's appropriate to have anger. It's appropriate to be sad. It's appropriate to grieve. There's no, like, weightedness from one emotion to another, and when and that's some of the work that we do in the conversations that we have, because when you start to see that, number one and number two, that you are not your emotions, you are you and your emotions are something else. Now that starts to diminish the fear and the goal is to get them out. I'm going to let you pick it up and I'm going to let the dog get out of the door so we don't. <laughs> and that's, and that's a beautiful point, Linda, that um, not identifying with the emotions as part of who you are, right? And that talks about how we were, um, I was just saying um, when we were talking about how that cycle happens, right? Your mindset influences the actions you take, which influences your outcomes that you get, which then influences your mindset, right? So, you know, when, when we take on emotions as who we are, instead of something we're experiencing temporarily, um, we, we invite that, that state. And another thing just, you know, if it helps from a physiological place, because I, I love talking about that kind of stuff. Um, when you're crying, do you know what tears are? It's literally cortisol being released from your eyeballs. It is literally stress hormones coming out your eyeballs. Um, so that is why, like, there's a there's a physiological response, right? Like, like Linda said, the emotion attaches to the chemical response. And then it has, the body has this beautiful, miraculous way of trying to get itself back into balance. So you you have a stressful event, you need to go into fight or flight to, to protect the body, to protect yourself. The cortisol is released, but we build up too much cortisol and it's not too good for us. So we have this overwhelming urge to cry and release the cortisol. Yeah. And when we don't let that happen and we try to shove those emotions that we think are negative down that's an energy emotion is energy in motion so now you're locking that energy in your body and that's why over time you know all of these chronic health issues show up so you want to get that out um that's a great i forgot about that that tears are made of cortisol you know it, it, so that's such a great thing to remember like i want to get this out no, so your body I, has checks and balances right to deal with these things and what happens linda like what you said you know we are you know and i don't want to sound like oh society and we're conditioned but we really are conditioned to just power through right and take yeah. it off and chin up mm -hmm. and 
just work harder, right? And we suppress it and we push it down. And when we don't allow those normal, natural, physical responses to occur, to release that, um, then it builds up and then you get sick. Like that's just, it's just how it works, unfortunately. So it is. And we just see so many chronically sick people because it is a cultural thing. I just saw a great picture. It was a picture of a little boy, like maybe four years old crying. And the caption said, if we taught our boys, it was okay to cry, then we wouldn't have so many angry men. Yeah, and aggressive or people. people. Yeah. Right. Because that's yeah. again, like we were just talking about before, we when when diabetics when their blood sugar dips too low, their bodies are producing adrenal, adrenaline and cortisol, and what happens? This aggressive response. So again, it's just this checks and balances um, that your body's trying to take care of itself. And Jen, if I may too, you know, a big thing is when you find the right person that is going to hold space for you in a very loving way. Um, and allow you to work through that um, with gentle, loving care, then you're going to find those fears are dissipated. And honestly, there's nobody I could recommend better um, who has more grace and love and care in her heart than Linda. So if this is something that you're serious about working on, I really invite you to reach out to her um, and have a conversation about how she might be able to help you because she's really gifted. She really, truly is. Uh, thanks, Taylor. Thank you so much. Yeah. And and, um, you know, and obviously I don't know anything about your background and, but even if it's big trauma, you can clear that even I have clients right now that I'm working with that have, um, you know, sexual assault issues, have significant childhood trauma stuff and, um, and it takes some courage, but we're clearing it. So Taylor, if somebody wanted to work with you, I'm going to put in the comments right now, or, or I guess you can also do it in your group, but I'm, I'll do it here. So people who really um, have any of that diabetic, pre-diabetic, insulin resistance, weight loss resistance, you can't that's lose weight. A big one, yeah. That's a big one, right? Because you're that it affects your metabolism. You're not using your energy appropriately, so you're not losing weight. All um, related. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's and I think people feel such relief when they realize that it's all related because it makes it easier to fix because now you're just addressing one concern instead of, you know, five concerns. Exactly. That's why I said to Jen, like all of those things, when you look at it, it's like, and I have this and I have this and I have this, but they're really not all that different as a, so I'm an FDN, which is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. And that's what we're trained to do is to look at root causes. We don't pay attention to this diagnosis or that diagnosis. We, we pay attention to symptoms because they give us clues. And then we go for the root cause. What are the root causes? Because when we get those, your body's going to be able to get to the place it needs and wants to get to and where you want it to go. But um, so you have, I can see your, um, your name, Taylor says Green Roots Living. So would people go to greenrootsliving.com or where would they go? Our website, but anybody who wanted to book a call so we could talk one-on-one um, -on -one more specific about what your health concerns are, what you've been trying that isn't working, um, and what you, what I think you could do to move forward, then they can book a free breakthrough session with me. And that is at a different address. That is at greenrootstransformation.com forward slash apply. And that brings you to my calendar where I offer complimentary sessions um, to try to help people figure out and get to what exactly is the root cause for them in their health, um, why what they're doing isn't working and what they need to shift to see a result and get the outcome they want. And I'd be happy to talk with any of you and um, help you if I can. So let me just make sure before I, I send it, greenrootstransformation.com forward slash apply. Forward slash apply. Got it. Yes, thanks, Linda. And I yeah. would look forward to talking with any of you. It's all one word. Okay. I hope that came through. And then, um, yeah, and with me, it's uh, Organic Health Journey. And I was going to put, I'm going to put here, 
Um, I have a little PDF that you people might want to download. It's some easy, simple ways to change your emotional home state. And your emotional home state is you know, those emotions that you tend to spend your day in, overwhelm, frustration, fear, anger. And there's some easy ways to change them in the moment throughout the day so that over time you start to not live that's why it's called your home state that's your emotional home state so it's just an it's just a freebie little thing let me put that up there yeah um, but just because it's a freebie doesn't mean that it's not effective you've got some really great strategy in there, so <laughs> i just say yeah it's like it you know it's um a great thing that, and some of the things on there you may not have realized could make such a difference with shifting mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So anything else, Taylor, before we say good night? No, it's always such a pleasure. Um, and thank you to both uh, of the gens uh, who were uh, getting involved in raising their hand. And I look forward to connecting with you next week, Linda. Yes, we decided Thrive on Thursdays is, is our jam. We're going to do Thrive on Thursdays. We're going to talk about different things to do with health. We might link a couple of conversations together. So we don't know yet what we're going to talk about next week, but we will be back and do Thrive on Thursdays. And then we both are friends with Terea. We both have done lives with Terea on July 1st. Um, I have scheduled with Terea uh, the lymph drainage and then also re so releasing toxins and releasing um, toxic emotions. And Taylor, maybe like we'll do it with the three of us. Wouldn't that be fun? Beautiful. I would love that. You know, I love I love some Terea as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll see you all next week. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Ciao. Thanks.